tonight as we resume our study of 1 Corinthians, we are continuing to study a fascinating passage in this letter. It's a passage that addresses the problem of sexual immorality practiced by the members of this church, the members of the Corinthian assembly. Here's what Paul wrote concerning their problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. He wrote, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, for the last few weeks, we have been working our way through these verses, highlighting Paul's arguments. He is arguing here. Paul gives arguments as an attempt to show the Corinthians not only that sexual immorality is wrong, but Paul is showing them why it's wrong, why it's not right, why they need to repent of this. And so far we've seen Paul argue two points, with the first point being this, that the Corinthians' justification for their sexual immorality is just plain wrong. They justified it, they rationalized it, but they're wrong. He says in verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, I remind you that what the apostle is doing in this verse is he is refuting the Corinthians' so-called justification as to why they felt that their immoral behavior of visiting temple prostitutes in Corinth was acceptable and permissible before God. You see, they had taken Paul's teaching that certain ceremonial laws in the Old Testament, laws forbidding certain practices for the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, but were now, in this era, now considered all lawful and permissible for believers in Christ to observe or disregard. And so they had twisted Paul's teaching to mean that all things in an absolute sense, not just the ceremonial laws, but all things in an absolute sense, including immorality, were lawful. And so believing that what they were doing in terms of their immorality was approved not only by God, but by Paul himself, because this is how they interpreted his teaching, the apostle again says the words, all things are lawful to him, But the all things that Paul was referring to were those ceremonial laws directed solely and strictly at Israel. Laws like what? Well, laws about what food they could eat, what we call keeping a kosher home, not eating uh, uh, certain unclean animals under the law, Uh, holy days to celebrate, feasts, holidays, rituals to observe, certain rules, ceremonial rules, and laws like these. These are the kinds of laws that all of us are now free to observe or free to disregard. They're liberty issues left up to us. But immorality is not one of them. Immorality is not in that class because morality is an unchanging law. It's an unchanging principle based on God's unchanging holy character. However, in refuting the Corinthians' justification for their immorality. Paul also adds that just because something is biblically permissible to do, it doesn't mean one has to do it, because not all things, he says, are spiritually profitable for our lives or the lives of other people. And some things that are certainly permissible might end up enslaving us and becoming our master. So as I told you last week, in light of the fact that this whole passage is about sexual immorality, It seems to me in the context that the point that Paul is making with the Corinthians is this. 
if we have been, if we, if we have to be careful about what liberty issues we engage in, and we do because they could prove detrimental to our spiritual lives, even if they are permissible, then how much more should we be careful to obey God in the area of morality? Because immorality will certainly, without question, be detrimental to our spiritual lives since it will bring us down and it will enslave us. Now, what's so interesting about this truth is that those who practice sexual immorality often say that they're now liberated. They're free from the traditions they grew up believing in, the values that they feel held them in bondage for years, sexual liberation. But that's not true. Not at all. Thinking themselves to be free to express themselves sexually, they have become enslaved to their own lust. That's just a fact. John MacArthur illustrates this truth by telling the very sad story of a 16-year-old girl who came to see him one day in utter despair. In his own words, he said this about her. He said she had committed so many sex sins that she felt utterly worthless. She had not looked in a mirror for months because she could not stand to look at herself. And to me, he writes, she looked nearer to 40 than, 60, than 16. She was on the verge of suicide, not wanting to live another day. Folks, does that seem like somebody who's liberated? That is a pathetic, tragic picture of someone who became a slave. Now, MacArthur went on to say that he had the privilege of leading this young lady to faith in Christ and seeing her life transformed by Christ, but really what the story illustrates is far from liberating you, sexual sins will not only enslave you, they'll destroy you, absolutely destroy you. And that is Paul's first point of his argument. He's arguing against the sexual immorality practiced by the Corinthians, and that it violates God's unchanging law, and it'll hurt you, it'll damage you at the deepest of levels, ruining your life and becoming your master. Continuing, the apostle gives his second point in arguing against immorality, which as we saw last week, is that our bodies are for the Lord, meaning they're created for the Lord and not for immorality. So, Paul continues, and I'm going to read verses 13 through the beginning of verse 18. He said, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but he'll also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ to make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Now, since we spent the bulk of our time last Sunday night looking at these verses, I'm only going to sum up the primary point that Paul is making here. Knowing that the Corinthians believed that eating food and having sex were on the same exact level as just natural biological functions of the, of the human body, no different, Paul tells, them, Paul tells them that they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. And they're wrong, he says, because while the need for food to sustain us is temporary and will not be a part of our existence in eternity, God created the human body to use for his glory, not just now, but forever in the eternal state. Forever. So while the need for food will pass away, <clears throat> our bodies will live on in eternity. So these are not the same things as we'll spend all of eternity in a glorified, resurrected body. In addition, Paul argues that because as Christians, we have been united and joined to Jesus as members of his body, for a Christian to be involved in sexual relations with a prostitute, as the Corinthians were doing, was the same as bringing Christ into an immoral relationship with a prostitute, which is such a hideous thought that all the apostle could do is cry out, may it never be, perish the thought, don't even think anything like that. And so because of the sheer horror of thinking that a member of Christ's body would be joined to a prostitute, Paul says in verse 18, very simply, flee immorality. Run away from it 
as fast and as far as you can. Don't, this is not the time to carry on a debate in your mind as to whether or not you should visit a prostitute or engage in any illicit sexual activity. You just get out of there as fast as you can. Now, as you can see, for a Christian to engage in sexual immorality, whether it be with a prostitute or with someone else, that is a serious sin. But not only is it a serious sin because it violates the reason that God created our bodies to be used for his glory and not immorality, but the sin of immorality is a serious sin because, as Paul is about to explain, it is far different than any other sin that we can commit. And that's the next point that the apostle makes as he argues, <clears throat> excuse me, as he argues for why immorality is wrong by telling us, number three, he tells us about the uniqueness of immorality. <clears throat> it stands alone as a unique sin. The rest of verse 18 says this. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Very interesting words, and frankly, this statement by Paul has puzzled people over the years because the apostle puts immorality as a sin in a class all by itself. He says that immorality is different from all the other sins because all the other sins that a man commits are outside of his body. But in being immoral, a man sins against his own body. So what does the apostle mean by these words? Well, let me tell you what he cannot mean. He cannot be saying <clears throat> that sexual immorality is the only sin that harms the human body because that's simply not true. Lots of sin harm, lots of sins, I should say, harm our bodies, uh, like drug addiction, uh, drunkenness, being gluttonous. In fact, the act of suicide, taking one's own life, obviously is a sin that harms one bo one's body in the ultimate sense. However, while those types of sins, yes, they do damage our bodies, they all are a result of an, in, uh, of an individual being influenced by external things, things outside of our bodies to bring this kind of damage. That's not the case with sexual immorality because immorality arises from within us. It is the only sin in which our bodies are the sole instruments and source of sin rather than something external that's influencing us. <laughs> In other words, every other sin requires something outside of the body to be misused and abused, but immorality is different. It doesn't require anything outside of the body to make it a sin because immorality arises from within our own bodies and it, it's its own source of sin. And, and that, in that way, it stands unique amongst all other sins. Here's the way one astute Bible teacher explains the uniqueness of immorality. He writes, although sexual sin is not necessarily the worst sin, it is the most unique in its character. It rises from within the body bent on personal gratification. It drives like no other impulse and when fulfilled affects the body like no other sin. It has a way of internally destroying a person that no other sin has because sexual intimacy is the deepest uniting of two persons its misuse corrupts on the deepest human level. That is not a psychological analysis, but a divinely revealed fact. Sexual immorality is far more destructive than alcohol, far more destructive than drugs, far more destructive than crime, end of quote. Now listen, it's important to understand that Paul is not simply arguing against immorality for the sake of arguing. He's trying to show the Corinthians why they should not be involved with temple prostitutes so that they will repent of their sin. So Paul's words are meant not simply to give these people information, but to stir them up, to turn away from their sin. This is a pastor writing to his people as an apostle and trying to, to have them turn away from their wickedness. And that's exactly how we need to take Paul's words. They are designed not simply to inform us, but to persuade us, and every Christian, that it is absolutely wrong to engage 
in immorality. It is a sin against God who created our bodies for his glory. It is a sin against Christ because it damages his reputation. It is a sin against the other person involved because it violates them. If you're married, it's a sin against your spouse because you violated your marital uh, covenant. And it is a sin against yourself because it will destroy, it will corrupt you at the deepest level of your being. Let me just illustrate the profound corrupting influence that fornication has on an individual. It's been the common experience of many couples who engage in sex but are not married to have many, many, many conflicts that never seem to get resolved. And often when they just have no clue as to why they are having these unresolved conflicts, but their conflicts are directly tied to engaging in sexual relations outside of marriage. Not only do they suffer the pangs of guilt. Why? Because their conscience, that moral monitor that God has placed within us to tell us what's right and wrong, their conscience has been violated. They're troubled by this. Also because sexual intimacy is the deepest kind of intimacy and to engage in it with someone you're not married to, it does internally corrupt you and it destroys that relationship and people don't even realize that this is what's happening. So be careful because immorality will damage you and it will damage your relationship with others. That's why Paul said to flee immorality. Run away from it as fast as you can because if you don't, if you don't, it'll ruin you at the deepest level imaginable. Now, so far, the apostle has argued his case against immorality by giving the Corinthians three points. First, he has refuted their own justification or attempt to justify themselves for being immoral by clarifying the true intent of his words that they were about liberty issues, not, not unchanging moral laws. Second, he has explained that our bodies were made, created for the Lord and not for immorality. And third, he's just stated that immorality stands unique amongst all the sins because it arises from our bodies alone without the need for any external influences. And now, as Paul continues and finishes addressing the issue of immorality, he gives the Corinthians one final point in arguing his case, which is that immorality is wrong because our bodies belong to the Lord. Verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, with these two verses, Paul closes his argument against immorality, and he does so by, the, by reminding the Corinthians of something that they already knew. Uh, they had been taught this, but apparently they had forgotten this. Notice that Paul begins verse 19 by stating, or do you not know? Now, if you've been following this series, you would know that this is the third time in this passage, this, this one passage on immorality, that Paul has said these same words, do you not know? Which means that he had previously taught the Corinthians these truths, but they had forgotten them, and they needed to be reminded of them. And that can easily be true of us as well. You see, so often when we find ourselves in sin, we are in need of being reminded of truths that we've learned in the past but have somehow now forgotten. So let me just tell you something about my pastoral experience. My experience as a pastor has been that at times I have counseled some Christians who have come to me because they have fallen into sin uh, in whatever the sin might be, but they're troubled. And um, I have to remind them of some of the most basic truths of Christianity, truths that I would not think I had to remind these people of, people who have been saved for years and years, truths that they learned years ago. I'm not talking about new believers. I'm talking about veteran Christians, truths that they have learned years ago, but when they have spoken to me, somehow they have forgotten these truths. See, when you drift away from the Lord and you drift into sin, something happens that seems to cloud and obscure 
biblical truths so that we tend to remove these truths from our thinking. They're just sort of foreign to us. We don't have a recollection of them. I've had to remind believers of such basic biblical truths like forgiving others. Now, that's fairly basic. As you've been forgiven, you forgive others. And it was like they're hearing this for the first time. Uh, trusting God's sovereignty, that he's in control of everything. Nothing happens by accident. You'd think that they never heard this before. God's goodness, God's wisdom, obeying their biblical authority, uh, loving others unconditionally. These are some of the truths I've had to remind some people of who have known Christ for many, many years, but have forgotten these. Folks, these are basic. You would think that they would know and apply these truths to their lives, but sin blinds. And we need to remind others of what Scripture clearly teaches. These things are not deep truths that nobody's ever heard of. These are basic biblical truths. And that's exactly what was happening with the Corinthians. Their sin of immorality and all their other sins they were involved in had caused them to forget something so basic Something that Paul had taught them and they had previously known, they just put it out of their minds. It's as if they've never heard this before. And that is, here's the truth that Paul is reminding them of. That when they became Christians, when remember Acts 18, Paul visited Corinth, led many of them to faith in Christ, the church was planted. When they became Christians, something happened that changed the status, not only of their souls, but of their bodies. Paul reminds them that when they came to faith in Christ, he says, their body became a temple of the Holy Spirit who indwells them. Now, earlier in his letter, Paul had used similar words, similar language. So let me remind you, back in chapter 3, verse 16, the apostle wrote these words. He said, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So these are similar words to what Paul writes now in chapter 6. But I want you to know the meaning is a bit different. Similar, but a bit different. You see, in chapter 3, Paul was referring not to individuals, but to the church collectively as a body of believers. He's communicating that the Holy Spirit dwells within the body of Christ's universal church, as well as each local church. So <clears throat> that's as if on a Sunday I would get up here and say, Jesus is here. The Spirit of God is dwelling here amongst us. That's what chapter 3 is about. However, here in chapter 6, when Paul says that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, he's not referring to the local church at, at large but to every individual Christian, every individual believer. So, my friends, let me remind you, when you placed your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came to permanently indwell you. The third person of the Trinity came to permanently indwell you. You can't see him, but he lives within each of us, each and every Christian. Scripture abounds in statements about that. And that means that your body has now been sanctified by the Holy Spirit's presence. There is something very sacred about your body. Your body is now a holy habitation where God dwells. In other words, just as the temple that once existed in the city of Jerusalem was the place where God dwelt on earth, so your body is now his dwelling place on earth. And the point that Paul is making in telling us that the Holy Spirit now lives within us, he makes, here's the point, and he makes it at the end of verse 19. He says, and that you are not your own. In other words, just as the temple in Jerusalem belongs solely to God because this is where he dwelt, so your body belongs solely to God too because this is where he now dwells. Therefore, Paul's point is stop your immorality. Because in being immoral, you are profaning the temple of God. See, if we follow Paul's logic and reasoning, for a believer in Christ to commit fornication would be defiling God's sacred temple. 
Now, that may not mean much to you, but listen to these words by one insightful Bible teacher and see if this truth doesn't impact, and even more than impact you, floor you, stun you. Here's what he wrote. Listen closely. He said, to commit sexual sin in a church auditorium, disgusting as that would be, would be no worse than committing the sin anywhere else. Offense is made within God's sanctuary wherever and whenever sexual immorality is committed by believers. Every act of fornication, every act of adultery by Christians is committed in God's sanctuary, their own bodies. That's stunning. That's a heavy truth, but it's truth. Listen, you are not free to use your body any way you want to use it. Your body has been sanctified by the Spirit's presence, and His presence makes your body holy, meaning set apart for God's use. Why? Because He is not simply the Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, and He indwells in you. So why should you refrain from engaging in sexual immorality for the simple reason that your body no longer belongs to you? It belongs to God. He's taken up residence within you. And he expects you to act in a manner that is befitting his holiness. But how did all this happen? How did your body become the possession of the Holy Spirit? So that you're no longer free to use your body for your own selfish gratification. Well, in verse 20, Paul explains it all. He says, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, here's the application, therefore glorify God in your body. So the reason your body no longer belongs to you is because when Jesus died, he purchased you. All of you. That includes your body. This is what the word redemption means, that Christ purchased you out of the marketplace of sin so that you now belong totally to him. Here's what Peter said, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, speaking of redemption, the purchase price. He said, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable, perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So Peter is saying, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. You belong to him. He has saved you from your futile way of life. You have a new way of life. And the Spirit of God as Paul puts it, now lives within you because you've been redeemed by Christ. We read the same thing in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, where the apostle Paul, in addressing the elders from the church at Ephesus, exhorts them to oversee, and he says, shepherd the church of God. Why? Because they belong to Christ, having been purchased by his blood. He reminds them of that. He's, he's purchased the church with his blood. And so if you're a believer in Christ, he's purchased you too so that you belong to him. You no longer have the freedom to use your body any way you want to use it. That's your old feudal way of life. Instead, you are to use your body the way the Lord wants you to use it. And how does he want you to use your body? How does he want you to use all the parts of your body? Well, that's Paul's closing point. As I said, this is his application. He makes it at the end of verse 20. Therefore, therefore means in light of this, what do you do? Glorify God in your body. Since your body <clears throat> no longer belongs to you, it belongs to Jesus Christ, then you are to use your body to honor him, folks, in all things. And that includes, but it's not limited, but it certainly includes your morality. Listen, Jesus died not only to save your soul, but to purchase your body. Therefore, you are to use your body to honor him, not to gratify yourself. This is why Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, to present their bodies to God as a living sacrifice. I hope you've done that. As a believer, I hope you have done that. Lord, use my hands, use my lips, use my mind, use every part of me to bring glory to yourself. He owns you. He indwells you. He expects you to live holy lives using your body for his glory. Certainly not for sexual immorality. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us to walk as we should walk. Lord, we thank you for these inspired words. 
from the Apostle Paul, your words through, through him. And we pray, Lord, as we have studied this for the last three weeks, that we might take heed to these, to these truths, that we might have a holy fear of ever falling into sexual immorality, that we would take heed to what we have been studying, that this wouldn't simply be a Bible study of information that doesn't impact the way we live. Lord, help us to be doers of the word, not only hearers. So I pray that as we walk through this world, tempted as we are, help us to be mindful of these truths. Help us as a people, your people here at Lakeside, to be moral not only in our actions, but in our thoughts, our attitudes. Help us to remember and not be like the forgetful Corinthians, but to remember these truths as we face a wicked world that is engrossed in immorality and has such ridiculous thoughts about it, thinking that this is liberation when in reality it is slavery. So Lord, I pray as the Spirit of God does indwell us, help us to live holy lives, to be mindful of that even though we can't see him, I pray you will help us to remember, and what a life-changing truth that is, that we indeed are the sanctuary where you now dwell. What an honor that is, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for these truths we've been able to study. May we um, not only live these out ourselves, but at the right time pass these truths on to others. And we pray, Lord, if any are here or are watching, listening, that if they don't know you, may you draw them to yourself, that they might see their need for Christ, who forgives all sin based on his death on the cross. Draw them to yourself. May they come in repentance and faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.